I don't know how many of you know this guy. I'm pretty sure the Germans in the room know. Just give me a hand up. So this is uh, our former chancellor, uh, Helmut Schmidt, uh, who was a German uh, chancellor in the 70s when we had a lot of terrorism in Germany. He was a pretty tough leader. And one of his statements was, Wer, zu, wer Visionen hat, soll zum Arzt gehen. In, in, in English, if you have visions, go to a doctor. So what he meant is, um, no bullshit. I mean, you should really uh, not live in the clouds up there, but, but um, work on the immediate problems um, that, that you're facing now. Interestingly enough, I, I haven't put it into the deck yet, but um, Terry pointed me to those SUSE doctors that we had at OpenStack Summit. And that's actually what we are talking about now, how the SUSE doctors can help you with your visions. Um, so the official SUSE vision you've probably seen before. Um, it's of course, as all the visions are, all the corporate visions, it's, it's broad enough so that everything fits under it to help companies become always open enterprises that empower um, uh, possibilities. Um, today, um, I'm going to try to work with a bit more of a concrete vision that we in the product management team, the part of the product management team at SUSE that is working on our cloud strategy, on our systems management strategy, our container strategy, the team that's uh, led by Pete Chadwick um, have. So my name is Joe Werner. I'm the product manager for SUSE Manager. Uh, and I have Pete with me uh, today, uh, who's the director. Um, what's your exact title, director for cloud and systems management. Um, I'll do most of the talking today. Um, Pete is going to repeat the whole thing on, f on Friday morning. So if you don't like what I'm telling you, <laughs> maybe the next try, uh, you can try again uh, with Pete. Um, just to kick off, I, I, I always try to point out that um, all the things we are talking about, like running a cloud, doing containers and so on, they should be seen in the context of what you actually want to achieve. And, and what you want to achieve, um, I think usually you can boil it down to those two things. If you're in operations, if you run data centers, or if you run IT operations, you want to provide IT services to your line of business. And an IT service, there, there are books about it uh, uh, from, you know, from the ITIL family and so on that describe exactly how you measure the quality of a service and so on. That's what we are talking about. Reliable stuff that some, somebody buys instead of doing themselves. Yeah. Um, de developers support that by providing software. So you could either buy that from third parties or in many cases you have your own developers. That just as a start. And then of course, um, if you look at how life, daily life is for, uh, operations mainly these days, a lot of people probably relate to this hamster wheel. I mean, it's, it's, it's getting faster and faster and you, you feel like you don't make progress. And that's really uh, one of the things we want to talk about uh, today, how we can actually make progress and not just uh, stand still um, with all the energy that we are pro uh, producing. Actually, this picture is from a hamster wheel generator. So they actually generate electricity from that hamster. <laughs> um, Kudos to Wikipedia. Uh, the challenge that a lot of IT operations have between the guys who do their development and the guys who do their operations um, is described by Gardner with this idea of a bimodal IT. I'm sure that uh, during the week or in other sessions you've heard about that uh, concept from Gardner uh, where the mode one IT describes uh, what the traditional operations teams would look at. They, they want to make sure that everything's reliable. They don't want change. They want things to be stable. They have waterfall-like processes with check dates and, and, and deadlines, and, and, and they use pretty heavy process frameworks like ITIL. And the cycles are pretty long. We've been talking to customers that would tell us, okay, we can't do service pack upgrades because we only can do that once a year and then we have to do the integration test for another three months and so on. On the other hand, some of the developers these days are working in a DevOps model, uh, very agile. So even in, 
in our own company, we have those, those, those um, two different modes. Like the SUSE customer center team, they can do five releases a day fully automated. And they have to, because there are changes, like just documentation changes or a new uh, end user license uh, that has to be published or a new product is added to the price list, those things, but also usability improvements and so on. So those teams are used to doing frequent releases. They have a, a high level of automation. Uh, short cycles, really short cycles, down to not just days, but sometimes really hours where they would do frequent releases. And, and most of the big ones like Facebook or Google are doing the same thing. They have very frequent releases, multiple releases a day. Uh, so let me just ask, uh, how many of you don't really know the concept of DevOps and need to know more about it? I guess it, it has been told so often that we don't have to dig too deep into it. Uh, the reasons for DevOps are, are, are pretty obvious. Yeah, this is th this pressure to bring your new features um, to market very quickly. Um, and of course, in the end, it's all about uh, winning and retaining customers. I mean, those features are done to improve the product experience. Uh, and of course, you want to, to be able to, to send uh, fixes to, to the end user quickly, so improving quality and reliability. Uh, and to make this work, because we can't do three-month test cycles with that approach, you have to fully automate everything. And that's really where a few of the other concepts that we are going to see later come in. Uh, this slide is uh, mainly, I think that was from uh, Forrester, right? Uh, that, that shows some of the numbers of adoption of DevOps. Uh, and as you can see, there are slight differences in, in uh, adoption in different industries. Uh, but in, in some of the industries, uh, adoption is really high, like in services. Uh, and there's a bit of a trend to use it mainly in mobile apps and, 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 and the web space, not so much in traditional applications. Uh, but still, like in services, they're doing it all over the place. Uh, there are even a few that you wouldn't expect, like that government is, is already starting um, to, to do a lot of DevOps style. Uh, healthcare, not so much. I mean, that's one of the examples. Healthcare has a lot of regulations, and you can't just uh, adopt a, an agile uh, workflow and still um, uh, do all the um, FDA regulation um, uh, compliance workflows and so on. Uh, Energy and mining is probably a bit, bit of a more conservative business as well. Uh, and interestingly, of me, media and ent entertainment is also in the, in the green space. Yeah. So those are just a few numbers um, that show that some of the industries are a bit more into it than others. But it's definitely a trend everywhere because even the light blue and the dark blue ones, they are already like they, they are at something like 20 to 40 percent adoption of this approach. Uh, I think we can just leave this picture as, is the idea of DevOps really being uh, this endless repeating loop uh, of an automated <coughs> continuous integration between building code, writing code, testing it, uh, and then bringing it into operations. And one thing that's sometimes overlooked is that part of the DevOps idea is also to monitor your results. So uh, a good DevOps environment also takes care of monitoring the environment uh, uh, and, and, and having a feedback loop back to, to engineering to make sure that if something goes wrong, they can react quickly. There are challenges with the DevOps approach in practice. Uh, one of the things that just obviously, if you looked at this, 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 this um, picture from, from before, uh, let's just bring it back. Where is my mouse? This is a closed loop. I mean, it's an endless loop. Um, if you want to integrate a partner into that, that it's a bit hard to do. So uh, once you have third-party software to integrate into a workflow that is DevOps driven, or you have your own like other departments that are not adopting that style, that have different roadmaps and so on, it's always a bit of a challenge to bring them into uh, a DevOps world. Uh, in general, legacy software that you already have and that you have to keep is hard to integrate. So we have one customer in Switzerland we talked to recently uh, that was planning to look into 
uh, a fully cloud-based, microservices-based architecture, but then the operations team realized that that would mean not really an improvement for them, but yet another platform they have to run because they can't just get rid of their legacy, uh, more traditional uh, heavyweight JBoss uh, uh, applications where they would only change the JBoss version once every three years or so. Uh, and then they, at, on top of that, they would have that cloud or container environment to run. Uh, so if you don't start from scratch, that's a challenge because you will only add stuff and you will add complexity before things get better. Of course, over time, when you can move everything to that new platform, the hope is that everything would, would, would be, become simpler. Uh, yeah, and then keeping things portable. I mean, those DevOps workflows help you a lot with agility, but usually they're tightly integrated. Now, when you have built such a thing and, and you want to uh, be portable with your workload, so you want to be able to outsource parts of it and, and bring it uh, to a, an open uh, a public cloud, for example, sometimes this can become difficult, especially uh, when you've, you've um, put all your bets on one technology stack. And in many cases, of course, those, those uh, DevOps workflows integrate into a cloud, and they, a lot of companies are running what they call um, um, no-ops or serverless. Basically, they don't own their servers anymore, like Netflix has all the infrastructure in Amazon. But then if they want to pull out of Amazon and go to Google or Microsoft Azure, that's always a challenge. Um, yeah, and then making sure you can scale up and down, that's kind of related um, to the same problem. Uh, you want to be able to use your own resources, third-party resources like public clouds, um, and, 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 and be able to move things around um, as needed and, 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 and as the capacity uh, demands. Now coming back to that picture of the bimodal IT or the two halves of the brain in the company, um, this, this, this gap between the two really have, has to be bridged. Um, because in the long run, you'll see that it's not really uh, strictly bimodal or schizophrenic, as you could call it. Uh, you will end up having very similar requirements in your traditional IT. Um, an example that I like to take is SAP HANA. Uh, a couple of years ago, when I talked to SAP customers, they would tell me, well, my SAP system, we developed it together with a consultant. We rolled it out over two years. Now we are, every couple of years, we are introducing a new version, but it's a very stable system, very reliable, but we don't change much. SAP HANA has, I don't think, I think it's like six monthly releases, so very quick releases because it's new technology and new features get in. So even in the SAP space, people start changing paradigms because technology is uh, advancing so much faster. And then they are doing new things with those technologies that, again, advance faster. Uh, so in the end, maybe it's not all about being bimodal, but it's just complicated. It's just OK. The job is complicated. We have to do the same things faster than in the past. And the same solutions that were um, employed uh, by my developers to be faster and, and more agile. We will ultimately have to uh, make available to the classic uh, IT operations as well. Uh, the three challenges that those IT organizations are facing as part of that process usually are um, what um, Terry, my marketing manager, really nicely uh, uh, put into those three C's of uh, IT transformation. The three challenges are, of course, always about cost, reducing cost, bringing down cost, um, while still doing the same or more. Uh, <coughs> handling all that complexity, be it the traditional um, environments and then the new stuff that you are adding. Uh, I mean, if you build up a cloud or if you build up a container-based infrastructure, that will, will be more agile, but it will, at, at a first, when you roll this all out, it will add complexity to your organization. Public clouds add complexity. You have more uh, uh, problems around how to manage networks, for example, because you don't own the complete network anymore. You have uh, um, part of your IT uh, outside your traditional uh, data center. Uh, and at, at the at the end, I mean, basically, you still have to stay compliant. And compliance uh, is 
increasingly important. It, it used to be just an issue of if you, know, if you are working in the healthcare industry, you had all those FDA regulations. These days, uh, there are compliance rules just uh, as part of Sabas Oxley, so just to make sure that your um, upper management doesn't go to jail. Uh, in retail, there have been so many data breaches that s people are starting to realize that it's a good idea to protect your credit card data, your customers' data, uh, data and so on. So uh, compliance is, is, is everywhere. Uh, now let's look at our more concrete vision of uh, IT in I'm just taking a random number, 2020, so a couple of years from now. Uh, it's software defined, uh, and why that makes sense, you'll see in a minute. Uh, it's scalable, we, we've seen that that's one of the problems that you have to solve. It's secure to keep compliant and to, to, to be uh, sure that you can't, uh, that, that, that you don't uh, run into problems with uh, uh, data breaches and so on, and it's, it's agile. So you can run the life cycle quickly. You can decommission and commission new software um, in, a, in an agile way. And of course, you want it to be highly reliable. So that's kind of the statement that, that we are working on uh, today. Now, a software-defined infrastructure basically means uh, two things. First of all, a lot of the technology that in the past was delivered as an appliance, like a, a network switch or a storage, an EMC or a NetApp storage, uh, under the hood can be built using legacy, uh, uh, um, uh, as uh, off-the-shelf hardware. Off-the-shelf hardware, basically just server hardware, disks, spinning disks, SSDs, and, and uh, network uh, ports. Um, and then this hardware can be described when you roll out new stuff, can be described in code. That's one of the concepts. So infrastructure as code, that's what makes DevOps possible because you don't only have your source code, but you also have the templates that help you to roll out that source code, build it first, okay, and then roll it out on hardware. I mean, it's easy when you're talking cloud because that's hardware that provides you with APIs. But increasingly, we see those APIs come into more traditional servers um, like Blade Chassis and so on, where you have um, REST-based APIs to talk to your hardware. And that's a, an important part because if you have an agile way of creating a software and then to actually install it, you have to send someone to the server room with a CD and, and install the OS and then lock the machine into the network and reconfigure the switch and all those things that, that, that won't be agile. Um, when we are talking about infrastructure as, a, as code, uh, one of the goals that, that, that um, SUSE has in that, in that uh, uh, context is to make sure that we have a pretty nice separation of concerns because in a DevOps style, when you have a startup where the developers are actually running their operations, like they just buy capacity uh, uh, on AWS or in, uh, in, in Microsoft Azure and, and, and run their stuff there, um, those guys know how to write all those automation scripts. They are coders. But if you are in a more traditional IT, you want the separation where you have the experts write the code, but then when it goes to production, you want to be able uh, to take that and just no, no Siri, I don't want to talk to you. Okay. Uh, those guys want to actually take that code that, that was written by the experts and just um, yeah, expose those variables and configure stuff for their actual use case. Like, okay, how many servers I want this to run on? What's the IP address of that machine? Should it be using template A or B? Yeah but not actually having to do that in code and working with the GitHub repository in the backend and stuff like that. Yeah, let's start uh, with a simple blueprint that, that I want to guide you through. Um, starting on a green field, the one thing that I realized when we talk about software-defined infrastructure, you will always start with a physical network switch. 
because that's the one thing you can't virtualize away. Because if you have a software-defined switch, how does the software go onto the switch? It has to be there. So you start with the switch. Uh, you, you start with real hardware. So that box in the, the lower left corner is an unprovisioned server. And now there's one thing that you have to do. You have to install software uh, on the server. Um, going forward, we envision that to be an image in most cases. So you'll have something that is pre-baked that, that doesn't really need a lot of configuration. Uh, it's really just asking you a few questions. So uh, in the past, we would call that a software appliance. Yeah. We are behind a bit, a beyond that wording, but basically that's what it is. Um, this infrastructure control server is the nucleus of every, everything else that you do. It, it will start setting up the rest of your hardware. Um, if you look at those boxes uh, that I'm using here, uh, they have P's and V's. Um, the P's are physical boxes, V's are virtual servers. Uh, Technology-wise, it's pretty much the same. It's a Linux running on what feels like a machine uh, to Linux. Um, the, term we are now using, and you've probably seen other presentations from this less guys, from the uh, enterprise server guys, they are now talking about micro OS for that. So that's an, an OS that is container optimized, that um, uses a new update mechanism that is transactional um, and atomic and automated. The automated part is configurable, so if you don't want the automation, you can switch it off. But basically, it means you don't have to install a new kernel patch uh, or a new SSL or, or open SSH. Um, when there is a, 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 a new patch coming from SUSE. Basically, we provide you uh, with patches that patch the whole binary blob, the whole operating system, um, but not by replacing it all, but by having a transactional uh, um, delta upgrade that you can also roll back if something goes wrong. That's really the concept here. We are making use of, of uh, um, ButterFS file system snapshots in the background. It's pretty cool technology. So this, this is the nucleus for everything. We are using those to build up um, servers with different roles. So for example, you would probably start with a monitoring server to be sure that the rest of the operations will run smoothly. Uh, you'll send, in this case, you can probably guess what we are getting to. We have a control server, a compute server, so that's an open stack, um, a network uh, server, and finally storage. Um, Ultimately, for larger environments, we envision SUSE Manager to take the role of that, uh, of that um, control server. But for some of our projects, like the OpenStack Cloud, but, and now also for the MicroOS framework, we will also um, provide um, entry-level uh, support so that you can bring up things without having to have SUSE Manager in, in your data center. Um, under the hood, going forward, most of that automation, bringing up the hardware, bringing up those software stacks, uh, will be powered by SALT. You've heard a lot about SALT in, in the last couple of days, I guess. Um, and there's a lot of potential uh, in that technology because it really allows you to automate through the whole stack. So from talking to the APIs of your Blade Center to um, rolling out um, the software, the, the, the management layers on top of your just plain OS, um, up to um, helping with the orchestration of, let's say, a, a Kubernetes cluster. Um, one of the examples of that cooperation um, uh, in, in the hardware space uh, with Hewlett Packard Enterprise and, and, and Salsec, we've been working on integrating uh, their new OneView uh, API. So there's the so-called proxy minion that the salt stack guys uh, rolled uh, together with HPE and that we are now using uh, from SUSE Manager. Um, I think they, they can tell you more about that at the HPE booth. What's the next one? Here we go. Yeah. So just to finish up this picture, we, we have the OpenStack Cloud. We have a storage, which of course in the SUSE context would be a uh, Ceph-based uh, SUSE Enterprise storage. Uh, now, on top of that, what we are building here uh, is a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, that picture is basically, apart from the implementation details of using containers everywhere, uh, is what we can now ship um, with OpenStack Cloud 7. OpenStack Cloud 7, so the OpenStack Cloud 7 um, has the integration of Kubernetes through, through the Magnum framework. Um, 
which has the, the one advantage compared to running Kubernetes natively that uh, you can set up as many Kubernetes clusters as you want. So if you want to separate those concerns and you want to give one department their own cluster um, because of all the uh, built-in uh, tenant management in OpenStack, that's, that's a really cool thing. And it's also one of the easiest ways or probably the, e the easiest way to set up a Kubernetes cluster from, from scratch. Uh, in this particular implementation, talking about the future 2020, we have those containers everywhere. That means that all the services that you see here, the control node, the compute node, and so on, they are all containerized themselves. So we are running containers, and then on top of those containers that implement the infrastructure, we run containers as workloads. So the, those Kubernetes uh, containers up there, they're the same type of containers, but that's your workload. That's what the, the end user actually uses. So Kubernetes, you've probably heard about it by now, um, is a framework that uh, is uh, meant to automate uh, the deployment and, and, and scaling and operation of containers uh, in a very clever way. So we have pods of machines that are doing the same thing and, and basically all the load balancing and HA is handled by the framework. Um, it's a really clever uh, solution for running large scale microservice based uh, architectures. Yeah, that's the kind of mission statement. So in our case, what will happen is that on top of this virtualization environment, uh, it always starts with, with one master um, uh, that would then uh, orchestrate uh, those microservices, make sure that if you have the same service, it, it's, it's not running on the same hardware. Um, if you want redundancy, so we can set up rules for that. Um, it, it can scale out by creating more of them and so on. Yeah, so that's the Kubernetes cluster. Um, the new product that we are pre-announcing at SUSECOM, uh, the Containers as a Service Platform, or um, CASP, um, is coming with a bit of a simpler approach where we don't have the OpenStack under, under the hood, um, but basically build the Kubernetes cluster on bare metal. As I said, the, the, the advantage of using the OpenStack approach is that with OpenStack Magnum, you can uh, bring up as many uh, uh, Kubernetes clusters as, as you want that are completely separate from each other, but if that's not the problem that you, you want to solve, if you just want scalable infrastructure for containers, um, this is a much uh, more lightweight stack. And again, uh, the cool thing about it is that it's highly automated. So you will go from basically micro OS images um, to setting up that one master and then the master starts uh, spawning uh, the other Kubernetes nodes and it, it's a pretty self-organizing system. The containers as a service um, offering is uh, meant to help customers really provision their own Kubernetes clusters uh, to run container-based applications. And uh, yeah, it's all about automating and, and, and making things easier so that when your uh, developers ask you for uh, capacity to run containers, they don't have to go to Amazon, but they, you can provide um, that capacity at a, a very interesting uh, internal uh, price point as well, in-house. Yeah, I think we've covered most of that. Now, one of the things um, that I want to, to point out, if you look at that architecture and if you have that architecture up and running, Basically, when you talk about a full platform as a service, like Cloud Foundry based, or if you talk about physical service on the, the other end, or other extreme, those are basically just special cases. So in, in the case of a physical system, you just use that same technology, but you roll out a physical box and install the applications directly. Uh, while platform as a service really is 
the next iteration on top of, of the container um, infrastructure. And actually, that's a trend that we are seeing in the, in the Cloud Foundry project that under the hood they are starting to uh, leverage exactly the same technology that, that, that Kubernetes is leveraging. So we, we think at some point this, um, it will converge into one layered platform where in the end basically the platform as a service is really just an opinionated container environment. Yeah, I mean, we talked about scalability, and I think it becomes pretty obvious that with that, num uh, that, that high level of automation, what we can do is really just add a new node and uh, let it join the cluster, or we can add capacity in the cloud and even you know, move things between the cloud and the data center. So the idea really is, and that containers help a lot with that, to be able to have portable workloads that you can move around easily. The promise of cloud has been that you can just add capacity to your data center. Uh, in, in real life, as long as you're using virtual machines, uh, that promise is not completely fulfilled because the virtual machines are not really portable. You always have to uh, build new ones um, when you want to switch between uh, environments. So containers are really uh, portable. As long as you have a container runtime running, and it's a compatible one, you can really move uh, uh, your workloads around. And, and the management frameworks like Kubernetes also uh, allow you to span um, between locations. Yeah, securing, that's, that's a completely uh, different topic now. We have talked about um, how we can highly automate things. Automation already helps with, with, this, with security, of course. Um, but one thing that you often see in a DevOps environment is that code is taken from unknown sources. Uh, and basically, automation scripts would grab stuff from a GitHub repository or from the latest upstream uh, uh, code and, and rebuild things on a daily basis and so on. I've heard from customers that, that had down times and then things were researched and they found out, okay, what went wrong is that some random open source project, they just closed down the, the web server and they didn't provide the packages anymore. So the whole build chain stalled because it wasn't able to download the things anymore. Um, that's where you really want to have tighter control uh, over what you take to build your software. You want software to come from your own repositories um, to be um, pre-evaluated and so on. And of course, to some extent, you can use pre-built packages that come from a vendor like SUSE, because we do all that work for you. Uh, and then the second line of defense, once you've made sure that only quality code and uh, code that, that has been evaluated and screened for, um, for uh, uh, security and quality problems ends up in your production, the second line of defense is being able to scan your infrastructure at any time and, and make sure that this code is actually rolled out. And if you know about exploits, you actually make sure that, that your production environment is rolled up to the newest versions. Yeah, uh, talking about compliance and DevOps, one of the problems is ownership. Yeah, in many cases, in a traditional IT environment, the developers, the software developers, don't really care about compliance too much. They deliver their software, and a lot of the compliance is done by the operations guys. But now, uh, once they take over more and more of the stack, like if they use virtual machines or containers, they, they, they own a lot more code than they usually uh, would own, uh, and they don't really know about those things. So that's really something that, that, that uh, organizations have to manage. They have to understand who owns compliance, uh, when it comes to making sure that, let's say, containers are, are secure. Now, one of the typical conversations you could uh, envision in, uh, in an organization would be a developer who's talking about how he's doing his daily work uh, in the coffee kitchen, and, and he's saying something like, I'm using code from GitHub. You know, that's the latest, greatest stuff. It's always the features that I need. Yeah, and then those Docker images I can download from Docker Hub. There's one for my Apache, and there's one for the database I'm using. It's all pre-built, and I just have to, it's one command, and I download it, and, and it works. Great stuff. And the compliance officer really 
can't live with that kind of world. And he tells him, you can't just run stuff that, it, that is coming from the internet that untrusted sources. Uh, I mean, these days, usually even your desktop OS warns you if you download stuff from the internet because it could be unsecure. And then in, in production, uh, in your enterprise, that's what, what engineers do. You know, that's, that's really scary. Yeah. Now, to visualize that again, it would look like this. There's a lot of red um, code coming from the outside, unchecked. You have your own code that you know, but then you use it together with that unchecked code from the internet to build your application. You run it on a container that is again coming from untrusted sources from Docker Hub, where the only security is that some of the projects say official, but they don't have any like uh, um, fingerprinting or, 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 or um, uh, checksumming or so to actually verify that stuff is, is, is coming from the source that it claims to be. Uh, so a world where you have that kind of control is really what you want. And that's what SUSE can do for you today. We have the SUSE Customer Center where we provide trusted uh, code that we have built from open source, uh, but we have hardened it, we have screened it. Uh, we also have the open build service for you, which is your own way of building a build infrastructure where you have tight control over code that's coming in. Uh, so you can build software from untrusted sources in a trusted way if you use technologies like the build service. And then going forward, so there are two projects. The first one you've probably heard about already, the Package Hub, which is now available as additional uh, channels for SUSE Linux Enterprise Server, provides you with packages that run very well on SUSE Linux Enterprise Server 12, um, but are not part of the supported stack. So it's always better to use packages from that package hub that SUSE has built for you that is tested where there's a community behind it that maintains those packages. A lot of the members of those community are SUSE employees that know what they are doing than to use the substream projects directly. Uh, and going forward, we will also solve the problem on the container side where we want to inter int integrate something like a container hub into SUSE Customer Center where we can provide our own next generation uh, software as containers but also allow third parties to, to leverage those frameworks. So we have a lot more green here and then of course now that's when we add the ISV, the, the software partner, they can go through that same uh, approach and as long as you trust your ISV you will also have a, a, fully, uh, a fully qualified and, and secured stack here. As the product manager of SUSE Manager, of course, I, I have to bring SUSE Manager into the picture as well. SUSE Manager, um, going forward, will really be your content hub, where all the content comes in from these external sources, from your own uh, build service. And you can make sure that you define very, very uh, Fine, in a fine-grained way what to use when you build production containers. It allows you to stage things so you can run the bleeding edge code in a QA environment first and then you can move it to the next stage. You can do your uh, pre-testing and you can then roll it out. Uh, that's uh, one of the, the important roles that the measure is going to play in, in larger environments. And just to animate this, I'm not sure if the animation is going to work. This container then of course will end up here in your, in your um, software-defined infrastructure. Yeah, uh, just to wrap up this part about the automation, one of the goals we have around um, continuous integration and what I'm calling compliant continuous integration, where you don't just have those fully automated DevOps processes, but you make sure that you have uh, tight control um, is that this tight control doesn't get into your way. We don't want to slow you down. We want to make sure that uh, those tools are not complicated. They are not uh, uh, hard to work with. They shouldn't take extra time. Uh, there should be as much automation as possible but still provide you with, with extra sec security. I think we've pretty much talked about how 
those technologies make you more agile. Um, so we don't want to spend too much time on that. Uh, and I'm also cutting a bit short on the, the, the topic of reliability. Pretty obviously what we are thinking about, and I just didn't want to make those slides too complicated, is about basically uh, being able to uh, fully mirror all of those components if necessary. And if you have been in, in one of the other presentations like the SUSE OpenStack Cloud 7 roadmap, you see that OpenStack Cloud 7 now has HA across the stack, basically from running uh, the actual uh, infrastructure to making sure that your workloads are highly available and so on. So just keep in mind that whenever we are talking about that kind of infrastructure, we are also talking about that uh, uh, topic of redundancy and, and, and making things highly available. Yeah, um, to kind of wrap things up, when you look at how SUSE can help you uh, with your DevOps, especially when you look at DevOps in a world where you also have this mode, uh, mode one uh, IT still up and running. One of the things that you will realize is that almost all companies are becoming software companies these days. Uh, if you look at manufacturing companies, these days when you ship a machine, one of the things you have to do is make sure that you can remote control that machine and can apply updates. Uh, companies like Rolls-Royce or uh, GE uh, that provide the, the airline industries with engine, uh, engines. In the past, you, if you were, I don't know, Lufthansa or, or Delta Airlines or United, you would buy engines together with your airplane. You buy, I don't know, 747 and it has four engines from GE. These days, those engines are leased. Rolls-Royce or General Electric will, will lease those engines to, to, to the airlines and, and they are remote control. So they get all the metrics from those engines and they know when the engine has to be replaced. And if they have to replace the engine, uh, it's not the airline that has to pay for the new engine. They basically lease it on a monthly basis or I think it's not monthly, it's basically per hour, yeah, per uh, um, um, production hour. And again, you have to have the metrics to be sure that you know how long the engine actually ran. Uh, same for the automotive industry, where there's so much data that is now collected by the intelligent connected drive. Like BMW is one of those partners we have, a company that is rapidly turning into an, an IT business that happens to sell cars. Yeah, and then there are the others like the Ghouls that start to try uh, to do cars. Yeah. Um, retail, same thing. I mean, retailers are not brick and mortar anymore. They usually have different channels half of the channels would be digital or mobile device based and they have a lot of data coming in from all those customers be it uh, data collected in stores data collected over the online portals and they, they they are doing a lot of big data number crunching these days um, making use of technologies like sip hana on on susanus enterprise server obviously yeah so one of the messages that we have for you is that we have a proven track record in that brick and mortar industry, in the traditional IT. We also know very well how DevOps can be improved and how DevOps works. And that we are really a trusted partner for you in, in, in that regard. And as you've probably or hopefully seen with those blueprints, we have a vision for a software defined data center that, that is really uh, fully based on container technology that helps you um, to uh, build a next generation stack that's really agile and, and yet, uh, yet compliant. Yeah. I think there's one more slide we can skip here if I manage to do this. Yeah, we can skip that last one. We have about, I think, 15 minutes or so left, left for questions, or 10, uh, both to me, of course, and, 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 and Pete Chadwick. And we also have um, Terry Schlosser in the room from, from, from Product market, Marketing. Uh, I'll, I'll open up for questions. So the question was about Container Hub and how soon it will happen. 
Uh, it's not part of our product portfolio, unfortunately, but the plan, as I understand, is to make sure when, when we ship the micro OS based um, um, container as a uh, platform solution that around that time we will also start being able to provide containers over, over the customer center. So that would be mid, mid end next year, I guess. Should be a fair statement. So the question was about the timeline for SUSE Manager and the integration into that picture. Again, we are planning to support um, rolling out um, uh, the container as a platform uh, around their release date, probably not when they ship their first betas, but because they are using salt under the hood for the orchestration, it should be pretty straightforward to also uh, bring this to SUSE Manager. Uh, we also are working on the con content side to make sure that we can consume. I mean, that's still a bit early because we don't exactly know how the protocols are going to work, but uh, there will be several approaches. Either we look at using something like Portus, like our own existing product for a local uh, uh, Docker um, repository, Docker container hub, um, and loosely couple that into SUSE Manager or a similar approach, but yeah, that's also in that summer um, to autumn uh, timeframe, 2017, yeah. And you'll see the first features ro are rolling in. So what we already have as of today is first support for being able to build Docker images, your own ones, from uh, SUSE Manager channels. In the past, that always has been a bit of a challenge if you don't want to consume SUSE Manager repositories from a machine that is uh, registered to it, but from a build system, and we are fixing that for both container build systems and, and uh, traditional like TV for VM building and, 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 and physical image building. Yeah. What are the uh, IP in the DevOps space? Can you can you discount those IPs that you are using for the DevOps space? Technologies that, 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 that we provide. Well, um, when you talk about the infrastructure, that's really what, what we've been talking about here with the, with the container as a service platform. That, so that, that's basically productizing a, a Kubernetes-based infrastructure. Um, we have solutions for testing. So we have the open QA test framework that we are using internally. That's, by the way, also used by Fedora on the Red Hat side. So that's becoming a lingua franca for doing continuous integration for a whole OS, uh, and especially for your yeah, testing UI experiences and so on in a fully automated way. Uh, that's a really cool project. Then, of course, the open build service um, that we are using for building our distributions. Uh, it's a bit more heavyweight than just running, let's say, a Jenkins server but it also is much more feature rich. It, it automates all the, oops, all the dependencies uh, between code. So if you check in a new compiler, we can make sure that everything that uses that compiler to build software will be automatically triggered for rebuilds and the, these rebuilds are scheduled and so on. And it has very nice uh, project management where you can fork projects in the tool and have your own uh, uh, varieties of certain projects, um, build your own um, overlays if you want, and then share them with others. Uh, what we don't offer as of today is productized, let's say, a GitLab or Jenkins. That's something where we think there are solutions in the market that are proven that we are also using internally. Uh, obviously, at SUSE, we use GitHub, we use GitLab, we use Jenkins, just like every, everyone else. Uh, we now have very strong automation for bringing those things together with SALT that we are starting to embrace more and more. So with SALT um, and some of the components in SALT like SALT Cloud and the Docker support uh, in SALT as well and so on. Um, this allows you to trigger a lot of that automation either from your automation uh, server, your Jenkins server for example, or make SALT the master in, in that game where, where it would orchestrate uh, your continuous integration chain. That's, that's basically uh, 
the story that, that we have around DevOps today. Uh, we realize that there's no DevOps product that you can buy out of the box at this point, but we're really working on making this story more comprehensive. And, and we are working on blueprints where we basically describe how those existing components work together, how you can nicely integrate them. We have a lot of um, customers already um, who are using like the open build service, um, the projects like at MTU in Germany where they are building engines for uh, military aircraft that, like the, the Eurofighter, uh, where they are using the build service to have continuous integration in a highly uh, regulated environment like defense. Uh, so that, that, those are really nice use cases that, that we already have. So uh, talking about yeah, monetizing those, uh, open QA and uh, open build service at this point aren't on the price list. For open build service, we offer support um, through partners and we are considering to, to, to productize that in a more formal way. So if you want the open build service product, uh, a project to be run in production, you can get support from SUSE for it. Uh, it's basically the same model that, that you would apply uh, uh, to other parts of our stack. I mean, the software is open source. It's based on open source projects. Um, open QA is another project that at this point is really just an open source project that we are using internally, that we are sharing, that is maintained uh, by our engineers. Uh, and again, we are considering to make this part of, an, uh, of a more commercial offering. In any case, you can always uh, approach your sales reps and talk about getting support for those parts of the stack that are not uh, uh, part of a commercial offering yet, like the open, uh, like, like uh, SUSE manager or, or the CAS stack that, that would of course be fully supported by the subscription. And as I've said, when we talk about Jenkins, GitLab, that's where we're still evaluating options. I can't completely rule out that we will have something like a DevOps package um, uh, that you could buy from SUSE that contains all those things, but at this point we don't have that. Yeah. Okay. Got it. So uh, the question was about um, offering a platform as a service. So there are two things I had on the slides when we talk a platform as a service. First of all, with that new container offering, the, the um, container as a service offering, we are going to address let's say 80% of, of what, what OpenShift is doing. We will provide you with the capabilities to run containers orchestrated. What we don't do is it's not an opinionated uh, platform as a service yet. So you would still have to build your own containers, uh, which is sometimes all you need. Uh, the other story we have is about Cloud Foundry, about um, using Cloud Foundry, which is the much more mature project compared to OpenShift uh, that has a lot of uh, um, uh, momentum in the industry. Some of our partners and customers are completely, I don't know, can we mention? Oh, well, certainly. I mean, currently, uh, Fiddle Cloud Foundry is certified to run its own stack cloud. So that is, a, that is a full platform service. We are, are also looking at um, building our own cloud foundry. Uh, yeah, and I was asked, uh, thinking about uh, mentioning um, uh, uh, partners that are using it, like. Uh, SAP, I mean. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, we're working with SAP around how to have a integrated cloud foundry as well. Yeah. It's a piece that, from a vision perspective, I think in the, in the, in the keynote today, uh, Thomas and Michael were talking about how we how we intend to build that. Uh, that's, that's, that's a part of the school we recognize the school. So, the issue has been a partnership on joining the cloud foundry foundation. Can you come up with a support, <coughs> commercialized product around Cloud Foundry? Or, or work with, or work more closely with partners. You can assume the 
Yeah. Of course, from a technical point of view, we would love if those two stacks converged over time. So we would be able to basically see Cloud Foundry as a layer on top of Kubernetes. If that doesn't work out, we would still see a lot of synergies over time um, for, for everything up to that level where maybe Cloud Foundry comes in with a bit of a different orchestration approach. platform as a service solution is a good thing from a control and productivity for, for developers because it just makes them not have to worry about things. On the other hand, containers provide a lot of flexibility and that's really what we were talking about is how do you give the flexibility that you want while still maintaining some level of control. And then the specific question was, what do we think the breakdown is going to be? I don't know at this point. I mean, the customers we're talking to, we have some customers that are saying, just give me containers, that's fine. We have other customers that are clearly saying they want, uh, they're, they're clearly saying they want platform as a service. Um, but I can't give you a percentage at this point. The one thing I will say is that as we roll out containers as a service platform, we will start looking at delivering things like OpenStack and other sort of infrastructure services as containers. And so then it becomes a question of, okay, so perhaps I use containers as a service for my infrastructure, I use platform as a service for my workloads. But the idea is that while, while we're interested in, in, in getting everything over on a Kubernetes um, and Docker base, is then that gives us a, a consistent platform on which to build everything. Mm -hmm. If that yeah, makes sense. It's more about the importance. Do you think that opinionated deployments are important? Yes. Or Docker will be just enough for most of the cases? For, uh, I mean, it's not a one size fits all. There are going to be some customers that clearly are going to want a full platform as a service. Yeah. There are other other partners that we're talking to, or customers that we're talking to, for whom containers might be enough. I mean, we have people deploying VMs today, and they just, you know, they're using SUSE OpenStack Cloud, they're giving their developers the ability to spin up VMs and do whatever they want with those VMs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, containers is just the next step on that. And it's going to be all based on OpenStack Cloud. Yeah. Right? So it's OpenStack Cloud, Kubernetes, and that cloud partner. Yeah, or I mean, when you start from the CASP level, that's where we don't have the, the, the open stack cloud. We, we, we start with bare metal, basically, and then build the Kubernetes cluster on top of bare metal. That's, that's the other future option. Yeah. That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, that's the vision. I mean, that's pipe dreams of, of, of product managers. So in, in, in four years from now, you'll see whether this was really just a pipe dream and we should go to the doctor or <laughs> we've actually made it. Thank you. I think we have to clear the room now.